Yes, hello to you all once again. Welcome back to Classic Dirt Bike TV, where of course we do our very best to try and bring you more of those long lost uh, vintage dirt bikes from way back in the day. Now we're going to start a brand new series of videos here on my channel and uh, this time we're going to concentrate on looking at the much smaller uh, vintage dirt bikes, uh, those little uh, 125 uh, screamers. So uh, from time to time we will uh, continue this uh, series here on my channel. But uh, for this very first uh, part one in the new series we're going to take a look at our first uh, few examples. So uh, let's dive straight into uh, part one. Okay, so let's get our brand new series of uh, classic air and uh, liquid cooled uh, 125s off to a flying start by uh, taking a look at Adrian Lappin's uh, 1982 Italian TM125. Now the name uh, TM is certainly not the most prolific of the Italian motorcycle names, but uh, nevertheless uh, these uh, TMs were super quick bikes in their day and were very uh, well engineered. Uh, for their time. But of course TM were formed uh, back in 1977 by two uh, racing pals uh, called Claudio uh, Flengi and Francesco uh, Battistelli who uh, later became known as Mr Engine and Mr Frame mainly because uh, one of the guys uh, knew how to design and build chassis and the other one uh, knew how to design and construct a motorcycle uh, engine. Anyhow, the company's uh, title uh, TM was actually taken from the two company friends' uh, sons, who were at that time called uh, Thomas and Mirko. And so in 1977, uh, TM was born. Although TM were not just uh, successful in the off-road world, uh, much of their early achievements uh, were uh, when they supplied their two-stroke engines for racers to use in go-kart racing. And uh, because their motors were light, uh, powerful and very well engineered, they were ideally suited for use in the light uh, go-kart uh, chassis. And as you can see, this is one of the later uh, liquid-cooled uh, TM motors with uh, reed valve uh, fuel induction and uh, a Japanese Makuni carburetor there as well to feed the fuel-air mixture into uh, the engine. Now, the motor's water pump was driven from this uh, right-hand side of the crankshaft and the clutch as well uh, was your stock oil-cooled uh, multi-plate uh, item. But as I said, these... Uh, TM125 motors could certainly pack a punch for such a small compact engine and uh, that uh, homemade uh, sprocket guard there that you can see uh, was fitted by Adrian himself because the racing uh, rules in his native Northern Ireland say that the primary drive sprocket must have a cover on it at uh, all times. Now the front forks on our TM were, uh, as you'd expect, uh, light gauge Italian uh, Marzocchi suspension units and uh, even for 1982 TM were still using these old school uh, drum brakes on this liquid cooled uh, model with again uh, small drum brakes here on the rear as well. But the, the rear swing arm was just a simple box section uh, steel part with of course uh, twin shock uh, rear suspension. But again, uh, they made uh, quite good use of alloy on the front and rear brakes and uh, wheels just to try and help uh, keep the all up weight of the bike uh, to a decent uh, level. And uh, also at the back of the bike, a quite sizable rear sprocket just to get the gearing uh, absolutely correct for that perky. 125 uh, motor, but a plastic uh, fuel tank and of course plastic air scoops on this bike as well to direct air into the cooling uh, system's uh, radiator. But as with all small 125 motocrossers, uh, weight is absolutely key to keeping these smaller machines uh, competitive on the track. So uh, as I said, plenty use 
of light alloy and plastics just to try and keep that weight uh, down. But as I've often said in my videos, this uh, lovely little Italian TM125 is yet another one of those bikes that you just never see at classic or vintage uh, race events in this modern day. And although uh, these TMs in 1982 may not have been your stock choice to race in the UK in that year. Uh, over in their native Italy, uh, these very quick TMs were still winning races for many Italian riders. Okay, so next up, it's a quite nice example of a 1980 CR125 Honda. And this bike here it belongs to Andy Hinchcliffe. Now, of course, Andy's uh, bike's not a fully original machine from that year, as it does have a couple of uh, non-stop parts bolted onto it, like this uh, beautifully sculpted uh, billet alloy replacement ignition cover, uh, which I have to say is uh, certainly much nicer than the Honda uh, original. Now, if my ageing memory serves me correctly, I'm pretty sure that Honda used uh, chrome plated cylinders in these two stroke uh, motors uh, back in the day and uh, I think for 1980 uh, that was a year that uh, they just used a standard steel line bore on this uh, particular uh, motor but uh, I think they also used a bigger 34 millimeter carburetor rather than the older 32 millimeter unit that they used on the previous uh, model. Now up at the front end on our CR125, these uh, forks uh, were about uh, about as good as you could expect on a small 125 uh, two-stroke off-roader. They could certainly cope with most uh, small bumps and uh, small potholes, but uh, anything bigger would certainly give you uh, a bit of a jolt. Now the brakes on these 1980 CR125s were uh, surprisingly good for such a small bike fitted with old school uh, drum brakes but uh, thankfully Honda uh, decided to get rid of that weird 23 inch uh, front wheel that they fitted to these bikes uh, back in 1979. But certainly a good strong uh, box section type swing arm here on the rear which uh, again it worked quite well on our little 125 provided that you backed it up with a decent set of twin shocks up at the rear end because uh, the Honda originals weren't exactly uh, up to scratch in 1980. Although uh, overall I have to say that these 1980 CR125s are still quite good uh, little bikes because they did have a good strong, uh, well-designed steel chassis and swing arm and uh, they also had uh, good brakes and uh, decent uh, front forks, although it was uh, probably best to maybe throw uh, those original Honda rear shocks into the bin and then fit uh, a much better quality set before uh, putting the bike onto any kind of uh, motocross track. Now this was another nice little bike that I spotted at a classic event uh, just a couple of years ago which uh, is a 1980 uh, KTM 125 uh, twin shocker which uh, once more is uh, quite a rare beast to see at any kind of vintage uh, race event uh, nowadays but uh, on the day that I shot these clips I never actually uh, got to speak to the owner of the bike to get some more information as to its background but uh, at first glance this bike certainly looks like it's the real deal because uh, almost everything looks original and period correct for the bike except of course maybe uh, those handlebars which uh, look like they could be uh, some kind of uh, replacements but again another great example of one of these Austrian made uh, twin shock uh, 125s. But straight away you can uh, see that this particular 125 has quite long legs here at the front but uh, how these front forks performed on these KTMs uh, on the track I'm not uh, exactly sure. 
But as far as I remember, these KTM 125 engines were very quick little power plants. Uh, of course, they were maybe not as quick as uh, maybe the 250 or the 400 or even, of course, the 495 uh, versions of this bike. But uh, if they were as well engineered as the mighty uh, 495 uh, KTM of uh, 1981, then even for a smaller 125, I'll certainly wager that this was still a very quick uh, little machine. But our particular uh, 1980 example here appears to be all original from 1980 and it even is uh, still fitted with its original rear shocks which is uh, quite amazing on a 43 year old uh, vintage uh, dirt bike. But it was a simple steel swing arm on our KTM for 1980. 80, and of course that big substantial uh, rear sprocket there as well uh, just to get uh, the gearing correct for that 125 two-stroke uh, motor. But once more, uh, drum brakes again on a little Austrian racer. Uh, not unusual of course for the time period but uh, in another uh, few years KTM would soon uh, then move on to fitting modern hydraulic disc brakes onto their future KTM models. But I'm still uh, pretty sure that these handlebars are the uh, one and only non-original part on this bike, which is uh, again not unusual considering the machine's age. But uh, plenty use of plastic on our KTM with this uh, plastic fuel tank and uh, the side panels, uh, which of course uh, almost all manufacturers of dirt bikes for that period were using uh, to good effect in the 1980s. So as you can see, quite another nice example of one of these Austrian-made uh, KTM 125s. And uh, in its way, it's a quite rare bike as well because uh, you can still catch glimpses from time to time of its bigger siblings, the 250s. 400s or even the 495s occasionally but you just never seem to come across these smaller versions of these iconic off-road racers so it was a bit of luck for me personally that I did manage to capture one of these rare beasts in its natural habitat. Okay, so let's uh, just take a look at our first liquid-cooled uh, 125 in this brand new series, which uh, is an iconic 1983 Italian uh, Kajiva 125 uh, WMX. Now, this is a bike that uh, will surely bring back some nice memories for a lot of you uh, more mature viewers of Classic Dirt Bike uh, TV. And this example here is a bike that I captured at the Telford uh, Classic Dirt Bike Show a couple uh, of years back. But uh, once more, these uh, WMX125 Kajivas were uh, maybe not so easy to find at racetracks uh, in the UK during the 1980s, but uh, in the native Italy, uh, these machines were very popular with riders uh, who raced them in the smaller uh, 125cc formulas. Now our example here belonged to uh, Nigel Green who uh, I did have a very brief conversation with on the day that I shot uh, these clips and we did have a quick chat about uh, these machines and uh, I'd certainly mentioned to him uh, how great it was to see uh, one of these Kajivas again and uh, how rare these bikes were uh, to which of course uh, Nigel just stopped me in my tracks immediately and replied uh, rare, uh, not at all. He says, I've got at least another 30 or so Kajivas in my workshop uh, at home. <laughs> so is it a uh, little wonder that uh, we never get to see these uh, Kajivas? It's probably because uh, Nigel's uh, got them all stashed away uh, where nobody can get a look at them. But uh, without doubt, these little 125 Kajiva liquid-cooled uh, reed valve two-stroke motors were uh, pretty awesome little power plants in their day that uh, had a six-speed gearbox and an almost unlimited 
spread of good uh, usable uh, power. And it certainly looks like uh, our particular example here has had a homemade uh, ignition cover manufactured, uh, more than likely because uh, spare parts for these 83s uh, might not be that easy uh, to come by. Now the front suspension on our Kajiva, I'm pretty sure, would have been uh, either a set of Italian Marzocchi uh, units or maybe even uh, Forcella Italia uh, suspension uh, systems, which for their day were quite decent uh, performers when it came to soaking up the bumps on rough tracks. And uh, at the back end of the bike, it was a good quality single monoshock Olin's uh, set up with a remote gas and oil reservoir fixed onto the outside of the chassis. And that rear shock was uh, connected, of course, onto this alloy uh, swing arm by way of a linkage system, but uh, again, surprisingly, still old school drum brakes on an off-road dirt bike for 1983. And uh, Kajiva, of course, uh, titled their rear suspension system, the soft damp uh, system just to keep in line with all of the big four uh, Japanese uh, manufacturers. And uh, just as in our previous bikes in this clip, uh, copious amounts of plastic were used on these 83125s uh, on the fuel tank and uh, for the air scoops as well, just to help direct oncoming air into the radiator to assist uh, with the engine's cooling. Although in terms of its styling, this was uh, still quite a good looking bike, which of course is uh, what the Italians uh, excel at uh, manufacturing, uh, not only quick motorcycles, but bikes that are also pleasing to the naked eye as well. Now, it was also around 1983 that Kajiva had an agreement with another Italian motorcycle manufacturer called TGM, whereby uh, they assembled uh, machines that were almost identical to these uh, Kajivas. And if you look at this uh, old clip of a TGM 125 from around that same uh, period, it's uh, very hard to distinguish uh, this TGM from uh, the Kajiva because uh, other than maybe different graphics and that uh, high row motor, it's still almost an identical machine. But without doubt, uh, this is another uh, very good example of one of these little Italian uh, stallions. And uh, as I said, uh, a bike that did almost everything uh, very well because uh, this machine again had a good light tubular steel chassis and uh, quite decent suspension on the front and at the rear. But the prize package was, of course, that uh, compact 125 Kajiva two-stroke motor that just never seemed to run out of puff, no matter how hard you worked it on the racetrack. And so just to finish off this part one in our brand new series of looking at classic 125s, we're going to take a look at another rare British machine. And uh, this little beauty here is Alan Botts, 1972, Wassel Sachs at 125. Now the British Wassel Company was established uh, way back in 1946 by Ted Wassel, who set up the company after he was uh, then demobbed uh, from the Royal Navy uh, the year before. Now his company began by supplying all manner of spare parts for all of the many different uh, British motorcycles that were around at that time. And then uh, some years later, uh, they also began stocking and supplying spares and accessories for the much more popular uh, Japanese bikes as well. But in their day, uh, Wassel were quite well known uh, for their beautifully formed uh, alloy motorcycle uh, fuel tanks and uh, things like front and rear uh, fenders. And in the early 1970s, 
Uh, there was virtually no one in the UK who was supplying a small light uh, trials or motocrosser, so uh, Wassel then decided just to go ahead and build their own chassis and then uh, utilize all of the components they had in their massive uh, stocks. And by using a well-proven uh, German-made Sax 125 two-stroke engine, they then unveiled uh, this brand new motorcycle at the 1972 Manchester uh, Motorcycle Show. And so our featured bike here belongs to Cumbrian racer Alan Bott and uh, this bike here is a 100% original machine that actually came uh, from the USA which uh, back in 1972 were uh, originally exported to the US under the brand name of the Tyron uh, Antelope. Although of course uh, here in the UK they were uh, simply uh, titled uh, the Wassel uh, Sax uh, 125. Now the bike's uh, chassis was uh, made of very light gauge uh, tubular steel and uh, the bike's uh, power plant of course uh, was a well proven and very reliable uh, German manufactured uh, Sax uh, 125 piston port two stroke uh, motor that uh, had a six speed uh, gearbox. Now these little uh, Wassel Sax 125 racers were uh, a British built uh, no frills uh, kind of a machine with uh, certainly no modern amenities that you may have found on a Japanese bike of that same year but uh, these were pretty basic little fun scramblers that uh, weren't going to put you on the top step of the podium at your next big international uh, 125 World Championship event, but uh, these were more aimed at your weekend rider who just wanted to do a bit of uh, off-roading or uh, green laning kind of treks. And uh, for a price tag of just £315 in 1972, uh, what was not to like about this uh, lovely uh, little machine? Now these little wassels were fitted with these uh, conical shaped uh, rear hubs with uh, naturally uh, old school uh, drum brakes but uh, this bike even it still has its original uh, Dunlop uh, steel chromed wheels but uh, most of the parts on our little uh, wassel were uh, very basic but uh, functional and uh, in a way it almost uh, epitomizes the period of old uh, classic dirt bikes in the UK in the 1970s. Lots of nicely highly polished chrome and steel and of course uh, the use of alloy for things uh, like the fuel tanks. And also for 1972 uh, drum brakes here on uh, the front. Now the Wassel uh, factory even manufactured uh, these very nice steel handlebars and clamps uh, just uh, before again having them all uh, nicely chromed uh, to a shine. Now there is a much more full in-depth look at this nice little bike in another uh, video here on my channel if you'd like to uh, learn just a little bit more about this uh, Wassel Sax and the bike's history so it's certainly uh, worth having a browse uh, at that uh, particular video. Although without doubt this is still a stunning looking uh, little bike that uh, just looks like it's come straight off the Wassel uh, production line in 1972. Such is the bike's originality and uh, its looks. Although just before we go, let's just uh, get Alan uh, to start the bike up and just remind ourselves exactly uh, what a Wassel Sax 125 sounded like in 1972. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed those first few 125 examples from part one. And these are just more 125s that are soon to air coming up in uh, part two. So for myself here at CDB TV, thanks again uh, for watching. So take care and I'll see you soon.